Hello everyone and welcome to the third webinar of Digital Marketing Analytics, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward and I'll be your MC as usual and your mentor is Alicia Booth. Before we begin the usual housekeeping, we encourage the asking of questions and the use of chat during the webinar and there are two ways to do so. We ask that you direct all questions relevant to course content to the Q&A section and that you send all administration type questions, dates, time, resource avail avail availability, for example, to the support team in chat who are right behind us. You can chat with panelists only or to all of your fellow students as well. And you can make that choice by toggling through the drop-down box once you've opened the chat log. There are usually some very experienced industry-based attendees who augment the, the content. So their, their stories are, are really useful quite often. We'll have a QA and a sessions periodically. Um, and if a question is particularly relevant to a slide, I'll interrupt. Safe is around tonight from IT Masters as usual. He's responsible for the course page, learn.itmasters.edu.au. You can find all of the course materials there and, and contact details for us for in, any problems you have. Um, we have a, another guest lecturer tonight, which is exciting, Dilhan Madarunga. Dilhan is a software whiz who uh, develops e-commerce systems and, and platforms. He has experience at heaps of online stores and Alicia worked with Dilhan at Lowe's. And the long game I believe is to get him to jump ship to wherever Alicia is for the rest of her working life. Uh, she'll pop in and out, uh, he'll pop in and hopefully very soon, um, but let's, for now, welcome Alicia and thank you for joining us again, Alicia, and I'm glad we have you at least. Um, I'll work in the meantime on getting everyone back. Great. Hi everyone. i um, not too sure how many people are in, but hopefully um, those who are not in yet will be in soon. Yeah, we've got a good solid 50 already, so, so that's a good start. Okay, good. That's a good sign. It's heading in the right direction. Sorry about any technical difficulties, um, but it looks like we're um, resolving those as we speak. Bit of excitement. Um, so we've uh, we've journeyed through week one and week two. Hopefully, um, those of you who have listened or attended um, found it quite interesting. Uh, this week, week three is all about um, a deeper dive into web analytics, so e-commerce analytics, um, and that includes customer experience, which is CX, uh, artificial intelligence, um, just sort of breezing over, um, I guess, the concept of it. And then we'll dive into uh, AB multivariant testing for websites. Um, so last week we talked about that for EDMs or um, electronic direct mail. Uh, you can do a similar tests for web pages and um, do things like conversion rate optimization. We're also going to be talking about uh, tracking uh, dynamic pages and um, a whole heap more. Um, Dilhan, I'm very excited to have him on board. Hopefully he'll be joining soon. Um, but he's got a couple of live sessions. Now, it will be really technical, but if you can just um, know that Dilhan will explain it in the most simplistic way possible. And that for those of you who are more advanced, um, I'm sure you'll really get excited about it as well. So let's get into it. So tonight I'll be presenting a few slides, but the main sort of uh, bulk of the presentation will be by Dilhan. So um, let's get into it. So what does web analytics mean? Um, it's basically the tracking and analysis of, of your website or a website. Um, things like page load, um, your speed, how fast the page loads, the speed of um, serving pages. Um, you know, things like um, how many page views per visit. So when a customer comes to your site, how many pages are, are they taking a look at? and time on site. So things like that can be really useful metrics to see if the content that are on those pages and also the, the technical um, delivery of the, of the website is actually working well for customers. So imagine, you know, there might be some websites that you've gone to where the page um, sort of doesn't load as fast as what you would like it to load. And then you get a bit sort of frustrated, check the internet um, and know that that's okay. And, and just sort of go, oh, that's a really poor experience. Um, you know, also when um, you're served a page, you know, maybe after a Google search, you might not get a page that's relevant to your search. And so then you might bounce and not look at other pages. If there's things like, you know, um, 
breadcrumb trails or call to actions. Um, that's a really good uh, practice to keep people onto your website and interested as is um, rich content like videos um, and, you know, live sessions like we're doing tonight, uh, live streams, they, they keep people on websites. So um, there's lots and lots of uh, content to discuss tonight. So I'm just gonna keep going. Um, one of the things that's really important is to track all your efforts um, uh, on site and um, you know your content management um, system and pages um, should they vary depending on the types of pages they are so we've got more about that in later slides um, so when we look at a b testing uh, the multivariant tools so multiple things to test on one page can actually optimize and improve the customer experience which is cx and tools such as heat maps which i mentioned i think in week one um, you know can Basically, uh, recently at Best and Less, we've been managing um, and recording uh, where people drop off in the checkout process so we can actually improve our conversion rate. Um, and just jumping to the last point, conversion rate optimization. That is really just, you know, having a variation of, say, a, a one color button um, and having variations of that. The actual call to action phrase that you might have on that button and, and changing variations of that all at the same time and serving the, the most optimal page. More on that later. So what is customer experience um, or CX, customer experience? Um, and essentially it's the measure of all the interactions a customer will have along their, their journey with a brand or many brands. And last week we spoke about net promoter score and it's a good measurement of overall ratings. So when you look at the um, the uh, diagram or image uh, next to, um, sorry, the image on the right, um, you'll see that um, your digital experience on desktop, mobile and in-store um, is a combination of many different um, channels and initiatives. So you've got paid media, search engine optimization, email marketing, social media marketing, and really it's, it's the experience across one or many. Typically it's about seven um where customers are really engaged with your brand so um, you can really shape a great digital customer experience by reachability so um, impressions and reach um, service convenience so i know that i use twitter a lot if i'm unhappy some of you might, might have seen my twitter handle with regards to a few brands because i you know i want immediate sort of action um, other times i'm happy to talk on live chat, um, or I might wanna go onto Facebook Messenger. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that before um, and just really need to get a really quick answer. And, you know, customer expectations are going up and up um, every kind of day, really. Um, but over the last five years, the customer expectation is, is so much higher. Um, and businesses that are successful um, are measuring this type of stuff. Um, and they're trying to improve it and beat the competitors. So purchase convenience as well. So, you know, things like Facebook shop or Instagram shop, um, you know, marketplaces such as eBay or Amazon. It's really about, you know, where is the customer shopping and how can we meet that demand and how can we be brand, um, you know, have a brand extension on other platforms. So when, you know, you look at best and less, we've got an eBay store, we've got um, other channels happening, we've got collections happening on Facebook and Instagram because we, you know, we know some customers would prefer to shop through those channels. So, so it's really important. Um, Personalisation and relevance, um, you know, is, is very important and, and using data to, you know, things like um, analysis of, you know, previous purchase history, um, you know, customer preferences is really important with that type of thing. Um, the ease of use and simplicity is really important. And, you know, I've got a slide with regards to Omnichannel. Um, I know a lot of you have probably heard that. Well, I'm sort of moving towards uh, channel agnostic, um, and that that sort of relates to the flexibility of meeting customers where they are, and you know, developing a a strategy that's based on where customers are, rather than assuming that they're just all on your website or all on Facebook or you know, watching TV or whatever. So more on that later. 
Uh, some trends for 2009, you know, the um, artificial uh, intelligence, um, the, it continues and it continues to evolve and become um, smarter. Um, data ethics, obviously privacy, et cetera, has really come to the forefront. Data management um, will, will become a barrier. And as I mentioned before, the omni-channel strategy will fade out and it will be channel agnostic. I've got a link down there as well, which um, gives some more, um, I guess, trends for 2019. And each year they constantly will evolve into others, but AI has been uh, on the list and these top four actually have been on the list for quite some time. So taking a breath, uh, hopefully we've got more people in the session. Guy, are we looking good? Yeah, they're filing back in. We've got about 80 at the moment and I'm sending an email to everyone enrolled in the course to let okay. us, to let them know that if they just click this button, they can get jump, they can jump right back in. Excellent. Um, still okay. got 80 in there and, and questions and chat flying away. So that's really good. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, let's talk about artificial intelligence. So refers to uh, machines basically with capabilities that um, they mimic cognitive functions associated with the human mind. So things like, you know, learning and problem solving. Um, the benefits is it saves both time and money by automating what would other be a complex and time consuming process. So in the olden days, 10 years ago, when I was at Deals Direct, we used to actually um, manually um, you know, analyze data and, and you know, have a, a lot of different segments. And it was based on a one dimensional set of data rather than all different types of data that's analyzed by a machine. So that's where it's really good for marketers, um, IT professionals and um, developers, software solutions, architects um, to really, you know, um, make more meaningful connections with data. Um, and it reviews, um, prevents human error as well. Um, it, it allows you to predict um, preferences. And I think I spoke about that last week with regards to the Amasa system that I'm using. We're looking at previous purchase behavior and purchase intent um, based on the data that we have from POS and from our um, CRM uh, as well. So it's really exciting. It actually improves customer engagement. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's really, um, it's really easy, much easier to um, analyze um, data and make quicker decisions. Um, so that's about it for that. So just, you know, um, how, how it's paving the way for digital marketing. It's, it's really exciting um, place to be at in terms of um, being a digital marketer, predicting customer uh, behavior and generating um, uh, content based on that is really exciting and it's it's very quick to learn so um, we do uh, Google smart uh, shopping we used to do that manually and now that's all done by a machine for example um, you know when we look at this um, this uh, image on the right we see that personalized customer experience AI tools can use multiple data points, including um, the customer's location, their device, past interactions and demographics to personalize content. Uh, it can predict uh, customer behavior um, using various models and um, can basically identify customers who are more likely to respond to offers and very, do that in a very um, quick way. So it can an anticipate behavior as well and um, use various languaging um, engines and processes. Um, and, you know, you can use it for your ad targeting and retargeting, as I mentioned, um, I, I think last week, a couple of weeks ago, sorry. Um, so I just wanted to provide this here on the right. You can see um, the machines learning what people are actually writing in social media and using that um, in a certain way and making um, assumptions and decisions um, based on, um, you know, the sentiment of a brand, for example, they're seeing what people are saying about it and they actually put it into a meaningful way. And they do that to uh, measure the su success of campaigns and actually um, able, if they're not successful as what they thought they were gonna be, be able to adjust very quickly. So NetBase, is recommended um, by me. Um, it is uh, one of the leading social media customer experience analytic platforms um, and it delivers speeds five times faster than other solutions. Um, now that's what they claim. Um, this has been copied from their website 
Um, but essentially, it's an artificial technology, artificial intelligence technology that uses machine learning, deep learning and expert systems um, for processing and uh, analysing social media. So it's very exciting. I've got a link there too. So this um, image on the right, it, it's actually measuring the sentiment of a brand. So it's analysing that. So you can see the indicators below. Um, and that will come into a platform and you'll be able to analyse that um, in a really meaningful way. So it breaks down every object in a sentence um, with sentiment analysis and it's transparent analysis um, provides a, a sentiment score, um, which is really exciting. If you go to their website, you can see uh, quite a few different videos and case studies, so highly recommended. Um, so what can you do with this type of platform? Well. You know, you can align your marketing message for each channel using social analytics insights, understand when and where your audience is most engaged, and that's where you can inv invest with your, um, you know, with your dollars or your, your content strategy. Um, and, you know, you can in engage passionate brand advocates and identify them pretty easy um, and reach out and potentially um, propose that they're an influencer for you. Um, and it just uncovers opportunities that you may not consider as well. So when you, you know, when you use a platform like this, you know, it, it does um, reveal some sort of opportunity that you may not have considered. Um, image processing, um, it basically analyzes um, and is incorporated into your social listening strategy. So you can see there on the right, the, the computer system is processing images, um, you know, on social media, whether the people are happy, surprised, angry or sad. Um, I've provided a bit of a link there. Um, in the course, this will be a very exciting topic that I'll discuss um, and that you'll learn more of. Um, so um, I can't really cover it all tonight because we've got Dilhan, but it's a very exciting, and I'm very passionate about this uh, this topic. So um, if you've got any questions, please post those in the forum. Okay. Do you think we should do a bit of a poll, Guy, at this stage? No, let's go with the video first. Um, okay. Is there anything sure. in particular you'd be interested in, in finding out? Um, so Has anyone, would, yeah, sorry. I would be interested in actually is if anyone has received an email from me uh, <laughs> saying what's gone wrong because I, I sent that to everyone and yes. everyone should have received it by now. Um, yep. So that's one thing. Um, okay. But yeah, maybe we'll just start with the video. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about campaign orchestration, which is a more linear and um, I guess uh, more commonplace in business uh, when you're putting a marketing campaign together and how you how we use your channels. And then I want to explain what um, customer data orchestration is and how that is more live data talking to different data points um, to serve content um, and campaign advertising, for example, in a more relevant and meaningful way. Um, but first, I just highly recommend uh, looking at Telium fundamentals. And this is where this video is from. Just give me a moment while I... Um, go back into the video. Um, yep. So I think, where are we? I think we'll just get my computer sound. Yeah. And I can happily report that people did receive the email. So we should get a few more attendees now. Great. Thanks for the update. Just trying to go to this video. I might just do this. Just bear with us. Can you see my screen okay? You sure can. And we can see the YouTube video. It's coming up now. We have big marketing goals, like optimizing amazing cross-channel experiences for every customer. It's no small task. And to achieve it, you need a simple process to orchestrate your campaigns across every channel. It sounds like marketing nirvana, right? but Nirvana doesn't come without challenges because budgets are always tight and the number of channels and competitors is constantly growing. Not to mention internal channel teams work in silos and they don't share data. So no one completely understands the customer, which means it's hard to deliver personalized and compelling offers or critical communications that drive satisfaction, loyalty, and purchase behavior. 
So conversions drop, the same with ROI, and funds go to other departments. It's a vicious cycle, one that feels like you've entered the ninth circle of hell by noon on Monday. Fortunately, it's a cycle that can be broken. All you need is a cross-channel marketing solution that can help you do a few simple things, like combine all your data, both online and offline, into a single customer profile. With a single profile, you can create personalized offers and content. Then you need to be able to send that content to any marketing channel. Finally, you want to measure the results and get insights for the next campaign. The good news is this process is now possible with a single integrated solution. You may call it Nirvana, but we call it campaign orchestration, thanks to the Adobe Experience Cloud. It's all about optimizing the experience for your customers and optimizing the process and results for you. Now, that was a bit of an advert, clearly, and I'm not sponsored. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> just so you know, I'm not that good. <laughs> so, oh, just God. jumping back on. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanted to sort of use that to explain um, customer data orchestration. But first, uh, campaign orchestration, what does that look like? So you can see the, the image on the left. Um, so it's really um, quite linear and static. So the way it works is, mar and this is very commonplace, marketing process, um, creating, deploying and analysing campaigns across multiple channels to build a customer experience. And they leverage data to trigger campaigns based on what a customer's doing, um, what device they're on, or their last, you know, their last experience in their, in their customer journey, the last stop. Um, it allows organisations to guide their customer's journey, their customer journey. And, you know, it's what teams use to, as insights to make decisions. Um, it's pretty much one dimensional in my opinion. And it's something that um, when you look at, um, you know, the other side of it, it's really important to at least understand at a very top level that there are other ways and other approaches to, um, to use data in a more meaningful way. Um, and you know, like some of the messages that customers receive um, and the decisions that are made about customers are really after their last interaction with the brand. So when we look at, um, well, I've done a bit of a typo there, um, data orchestration, it's really a universal approach. And as the video ex sort of explained, it's a single customer view. It connects data in real time across multiple teams, technologies and customer touch points. So it can use data like, you know, your POS data that you have in a store. It can, it can connect that into a system uh, that is also using other data from other systems to actually give a, a more um, 360 view of a customer. Um, and then, you know, you're able to serve content that's specific to the customer who's in a particular platform. So, um, it actually avoids the silos in organizations. So, you know, at Lowe's, um, the POS data was very much completely separate to uh, the website data. And it was all about manually trying to link that in together and then make some insights and decisions. Whereas, um, you know, these types of platforms that are, are available, and this is one of the good ones that I just showed before with Telium, um, it really is very seamless and, you know, great dashboards and, it really improves the customer experience. And that's really what we want to get to in a very quick way without doing manual um, data mining, for example. Um, so moving on to Omnichannel. I mean, five years ago, I was talking about Omnichannel in a lot of Andrew Mashman web webinars, if any of you attended those. Um, but, you know, as we move um, forward in the customer, it's all about the customer and, and what they're doing. There's been a lot of um, documentation around a channel agnostic. And what that means is rather than offering several channels to everyone, companies will have a better chance of segmenting their customers, analyzing their preferences of those segments and offering only the channels that um, they identify with or resort to the most. So if you've got a customer that's only on Instagram and maybe comes to the website every now and again, you can really invest your money in that particular cohort of customers that are on Instagram. And that's certainly what we're doing at Best and Less. Um, when um, all of your interactions, customer interactions are in the one place, you, you definitely get a better um, sense of what your customer 
your customers' needs are. Um, so you can be preemptive. Um, you can you can see you know um, what they're talking about. You can see you know what they're interested in, and you can serve really great campaigns to them. So um, I've got a link there with regards to um, the Telium article. So it's definitely worth a read. Okay, so moving along to web technology, uh, and I'm shortly about to int introduce Stillhan. Hopefully, he's online now. Um, oh yes, we have we have Dilhan. Don't worry about that. Oh, good. Okay, great. Um, so, web technology, by definition, is the way computers communicate with each other. Um, the language used is. Um, often called markup and multimedia packages. It's meant to interact with hosted information like websites. Um, web technology involves the use of hypertext markup. I'm not sure if you've heard that before, but um, Dylan will talk more about it. And CSS, which is cascading style sheets, which makes it look pretty. So I know that Dylan's got a couple of slides um, as examples. I don't want to steal his thunder. Um, he will dive more into the technology, but essentially the web is a service that operates over the internet, just as email does. Um, and, you know, according to Microsoft, web technologies include markup lang languages such as HTML, CSS, XML, CGI, and HTTP, um, and programming languages and technologies that help create applications for the web. Uh, th I thought it'd be interesting to you to know that, you know, uh, in my experience, there's three types of websites, dynamic websites, uh, the old static page websites, and then there's uh, an, another type called single page apps. Um, so I'll go into more detail in a moment. So what's the difference between static and dynamic? And this certainly is a precursor to Dilhan's presentation. I wanted to keep it really um, straightforward and and basic. Um, so basically static um, is static websites, um, the pages already exist on the server. So as you can see on the right, the web ser server's there. Um, and dynamic pages are built on the fly um, as, the as the client calls on the server. And um, they're sent to the browser and it comes from various other pages and databases and other sources on the server or the web and it actually serves that page to the to the customer or client um, and uh, the server must build it before sending um, and that's pretty much the difference so yeah, as you can see there the client's browser or the customer browser okay so I'm just going to briefly talk about canonical URLs and tracking dynamic pages. So um, canonical um, URLs are a way of telling search engines that um, a ca canonical tag represents the main copy of a page. So um, often when you've got um, pages like um, you can see there bestandless.com.au. Um, there's different ways that you can get to that page and we want to track all the pages that are served to a client. So um, it basically enables um, or disables duplication uh, because Google selects the best one as a canonical URL, but you can actually do it yourself as a developer. Um, and, you know, there's always duplicate content. So we want to make sure that we're tracking the performance of um, the amount of calls that are, um, that a customer's doing. Um, and yeah, it just tracks and tags um, the URLs from a page. Um, single page applications. It's basically um, a web application or website that loads all of the resources. So all of the content um, required to navigate through the site. It's sort of like a mobile type of um, experience. So as the user clicks uh, links and interacts with the page, um, the, the content is loaded dynamically. Um, hopefully you're following me here, but um, Dylan will dive in a little bit deeper um, with some uh, examples. Um, the application will often update the URL in the address bar. So um, hopefully you remember the URL at the top when you're navigating in your browser. Um, that will often change, um, but another full page request is never made with um, SPAs. Um, and the final point there is interaction with the single page application often involves dynamic communication with the web server behind the scenes. Below is, um, if you're more interested, is a, a little bit of a guide with regards to that. 
Um, I'm just going to jump down to the final points to give you an example. Um, so the About Us page can be reached via any of the following URLs. So forward slash about dot html forward slash hash about dot html and so on and so forth and what we want to do is to avoid any duplications in google analytics for example so it's best best to capture the canonical um, url forward slash about dot html um, so yeah all right so shall we do a poll before I'm working on them. one now. Okay, I might very introduce. Very good one, I might add. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one, one must build suspense. Uh, yes, and give maybe a great time right. for, for Dilhan <laughs> to to jump online, uh, uh, chuck his microphone on, and yep. go through the process of getting his slideshow ready. Sure. I'm very excited to hear from Dilhan. How are you going, Dilhan? Hello, hello. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Can you uh, please turn your mic to maximum and start shouting down it because you're, you're, okay, you're far so too modest and softly spoken for my liking. It's got to be okay. all bombastic all the time. Yeah, give me a second. No worries at all. That's really good. That sounds great. And mm. I, might, I might just introduce you. Please do. So uh, Dilhan is um, originally from Sri Lanka and um, I met Dilhan whilst working at freshflowers.com au through um, an agency called Netstarter and uh, they're still around today although they don't do web services anymore um, web development I should say um, so Dylan and I um, formed a great relationship he built a great uh, website solving so many solutions and essentially um, Dylan and I um, have worked together at Lowe's and uh, he's just next level um, systems architect and designer um, so I'm really privileged that he's um, agreed to present tonight um, and I hope you enjoy his session um, he's got a bachelor bachelor of science uh, major in physics electronics and pure mathematics which is just mind-blowing um, his speciality e-commerce platform development is magento 2 which is a really cool it's one of my favorite platforms it's actually my favorite um, but he's got over 12 years of senior web technology experience and his rap sheet is pretty impressive top shop he's built top shop website sass and bide lowe's glue fresh flowers camilla active skin i've got lowe's there twice uh iframes australia so um i'd really uh i'm really proud to present dilhan thank you very much Alicia. so i'm trying to bring my, share the page yeah yeah, yeah. take your time uh, no, I cannot. Uh, guy, you need to do the setting, I guess. I cannot start screen while Alicia is. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I'll stop share. Okay. I might stop share so you can grab the page. Uh, so it looks like I can see. Okay. A yeah. You're right. Okay. I'm there, right? Yes. Great. Okay. You can see my screen. Thank you very much, Elisha, for your kind introduction. It's uh, too much, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I really appreciate the words and I really appreciate the opportunity you gave me to participate in this wonderful meeting. And no this, problem. Of course. So without saying much, I will jump to my slides. Yeah, might want to go to uh, present as well. So yeah, I will do that. Yep. So yeah, yeah. So already Excellent. you spoke uh, some of the web technology stuff. So I will just move to the next slide, which is how our web requests bring us results. So let's say now you are going to IT Masters website. What you do is you enter the URL or the domain or whatever we call it on the web browser, let's say Chrome. So if you have an internet connection, then the web browser tries to connect you through to the internet service provider. So let's say you have a Telstra connection. This means the Telstra uh, service. So the thing is that when it comes to the internet, the servers 
the routers, the switches, they don't know anything about this URL, okay? So it all depends on everything is introduced and recognized by just the IP address. So to talk to something or someone, so some server, we need to know their IP address. So how do we do this conversion? So that is where the domain name servers jump into the scene. So the domain name server is uh, like a name uh, key value mapping. It has the domain name mapped to the IP address. So if we know the IP address, which is a response uh, from the DNS servers, then the internet knows how the protocol, how to jump to the internet switches and this all uh, huge network and find the correct server responding to your request. So when the request reaches the server, then it knows how to handle and or how to respond to your request. So it will respond with the information and it will go through the cloud back to your computer or the browser. Uh, that's pretty much it. So that's how the internet basically works. So everything is transferred through this network back and forth with information like I'm going to show you in the next few slides and the demo. So first of all, I'll do something like this. You all know this ping command, which is a popular one. So now I'm trying to find the IP address for itmasters.edu.au. So because internet does not know about the URL, it knows only about the IP address. Okay. So I try to do this. So I end up with an IP address like this. So you have, you may notice that this is a little bit, bit different from the previous IP address we used because this is now we, we have two things called IPv4 and IPv6. But anyway, this is also an IP address, but in the newer version. So let's say ping google.com. So this is the Google's IP address in the IPv6 format. So this is how the Google servers are recognized through the web. And the IP address can be changed based on their server structures. Okay, this is some kind of a demonstration back again. Uh, there's a website called dialogue.lk, which is a telecommunication provider in Sri Lanka. So if I try to access that website through, from here, let's see what will happen. I already ran this to save time. So let's see what, Happen. So I start from Penan Hills. Maybe that's where my Telstra or my internet connections ISP servers are. Okay, I will run this. So as you can see here, it is hopping through the internet or switches routers to get somewhere and find the responsible server for this one. All discussed or connected through the IP address like given here. So now it jumps to the Hong Kong servers, then back to Singapore, then it found the connection to Sri Lanka. And from the Sri Lankan telecommunication provider, that means the main manager of the Sri Lankan internet services has redirected that to the correct head office headquarters of the uh, company. So see how many hops we have taken to reach this final destination. So it's a lot like, it's not a direct call. When you try to hit a URL on the browser, if you, the page just start loading, but it's not a single request that connects instantly. It's a request that hop through the internet through several routers and IPs. So I will give one more, apple.com. So from here, it will take some time anyway. 
because this is a demonstration I try to render the things it will hop through the internet and go back and forth it's not a direct connection it goes through this pathway but the pathway can be different from time to time but it should actually finally end up somewhere that it finds the apple's main service we'll give it a couple of more seconds This is incredibly interesting, Dylan. Can anyone use this? Yeah, yeah. This this is an open uh, Java-based uh, visual trace route. We call it. And you're in Hunters Hill. Yeah, I'm not Hunters Hill. I'm in Rockdale currently. <laughs> <laughs> but my my IS servers may be recognized. The IP address is somewhere related to that area. As long as there's like, we're not going to, ex, you know, extend yeah. the privacy of yeah. where you actually right. live. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, looks like it, it's taking some time. So I will just hop to the next stuff. Okay. So, uh, like I said, the internet is built upon a huge network of servers, routers, switches, and all those things. That's why we, we take these pathways to the end servers. So next slide, we, I'm going to speak about the HTTP and HTTPS versions of the web pages. So hypertext transfer protocol, which is the protocol govern, uh, governing the internet. But now, uh, early days we had these websites, but nowadays the mo most of the websites are going to uh, inherit this HTTPS version of it, which is the secure socket layer with uh, certific secure certificates. So uh, for an example, let's take this connection. This is an HTTP, HTTP connection, but it is insecure because the data is transferred in raw formats. So if anyone intercepts this data packet, then he has the prob probability to know that what you are talking about, the server and the user. So when it comes to the HTTPS, the information transferred to the user and the server is encrypted. So it is like a, like a key. This user has a key, the server has a key, they lock it, and then pass it through the internet. Then the, let's say the server received it and it only has, it has the key to unlock it, but no one else. So the SSL websites, nowadays it's very popular because it implements the security, right? So everyone looks for the, their title bars to find if, if it is a secure website to access. So that's very important. So this is kind of a user access in the website let's say IT master's main website. So the, your browser send a request to the web server, including their SSL versions, the certificate session data, and the server will receive it. And it will try to send back some information specific to the server, again, including some SSL certificate that we have installed in the server and some session data and the preferred encryption method. So it comes back to your browser and then browser validates that response with the certificate signatures it already has. So there are several main certificate providers in the world like McAfee, Verizon. So they provide certificates to signatures to these browsers and they provide certificates to the servers like DevOps. So in this way, they know what they're talking about in the same language. So when this handshake is done, then the, your browser will start uh, encrypting the data using this special signature and the server knows that is the one you are going to encrypt it and therefore it knows how to decode it. So from there onwards, the browser or your computer and the server agrees to encrypt and decrypt the information using the same key. 
So which means the third parties, even if they intercept the packet, it's just rubbish or the gibberish for them. They won't be able to decode it. So this is very important. More detailed version of it. You can Google it for more information. I'll move forward. Okay, the web page rendering. Elisha already mentioned a few of the things, but yes, the web page, let's say take a web page, it basically consists of three layers. The HTML, which is the skeleton or the basic instruction or the layout. Browser know how to read it and render it. But when it comes to the skin and makeup of a website, it is the CSS, we call it cascading style sheets. That's how you beautify your website. I will show you shortly. And on top of that, we have JavaScript as the muscles and brain, which does all the pretty cool stuff like animations, sliders, chat boxes, searches, Ajax calls, which mean asynchronous behind the scene calls to the servers to fetch information, recording your stuff, even website tracking, mostly done by this JavaScript layer. So pretty basic, pretty much it. That's all the browser know. It knows how to read HTML. It knows how to apply CSS instructions on top of the layout and it knows how to render the JavaScript and execute JavaScript. So what we do basically in the backend server side is building these three layers and pass it to the browser. So when it comes to the server side, the things are much more complicated. Web servers, that means who can listen to the, your request and respond it accordingly are called web servers. There are pretty many of them, like Apache, Nginx, they are open source, IIS, which is by Microsoft, Tomcat, Java developers know this server, and Node.js, another JavaScript-based server. And when it comes to developing the business logic of the website, let's say if you are doing the, if you're on Facebook, then there's a business logic running on the website that renders your friend list, your post, specific view for you, like dynamically generated web page, like Elisha explained. So these languages like PHP, Java, .NET, Perl, Python, Go, these languages does this magic of combining all this business logic into something like this. To do that, it needs some databases like data, your personal information, your friends list, how many friends you have, and your privacy parameters, your names, your emails, everything are stored in databases like MySQL, Microsoft SQL, Oracle, MongoDB, and so on and so. And together with other services like searching engines, caching engines, the server-side applications build three layers like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and the web browser knows how to render it into a beautiful website. Okay, I will move, jump back on to... Something like this. So you already have seen this, I know, because this is service and SW official web page. I took it for the demonstration. Uh, this no offense. So now this is the website. Finally, we you see on your browser. But if you go to see the HTML structure, I some did something like this. Oh my what? God. <laughs> That's Dylan's usual day. <laughs> That's what it looks like. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Do you want to so, explain what that is, Dylan? Yeah, yeah. So, if I go to the, now this is what we see. What, this is the rendered web page. But if you go to the page source, control U, you see the actual. 
actual thing that is received at the web browser. This is called the layout structure, which is HTML, like Elisha mentioned. HTML is just like another type of XML, but it is the language that browsers speak. So for an example, I will show you. So this is a link for some kind of a CSS file, which is a cascading style sheet. This contains font details and some loader details, social these media, like, see, so many CSS files and some images. It's another link to Apple Touch icon, see? This is linked to the HTML structure. These are called the resources on a web page. So this is pretty ugly, so I will go back to this one. <laughs> <laughs> and now, let's say the browser has received this layout instructions, but if I disable the CSS, all the styles of the web page, this is what it really looks like. Still ugly, right? So this is pretty, uh, this did, if you remember the early web pages in the early web, this is how it <laughs> looked like. So it is just like a Word document, a website, but today it's more. This much is what it looks like on my old Nokia. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> remember okay. those banners that used to have like a, a headline that went across the whole page and <laughs> wow, just kept moving? Right. <laughs> yeah, mark your tags, everything. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. So now I enable the CSS again. So another thing, if I, uh, if you have using a Chrome or Firefox like browser, modern browser, we all have this inspect element developer tools installed in it. So by simply by pressing F12, you can enable it. So I will show you some of the CSS. Now this element, this is called a div tag and this is called the CSS behind it. So the browser renders this CSS to make it pretty. So we instruct the browser to make the background to blue. So that's why this section is blue. Something like that, you get the idea, right? So if I made it red, it becomes red. So this is the pretty much skin and makeup of the website. Now, when it comes to the JavaScript, okay, I have this website, IT Masters website. I think I know that one. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So if, let's say, if I disable the JavaScript, what will happen? These sliders will stop working. And these chat boxes will stop working because all those animations, rendering, everything is done through JavaScripts. In the network panel, I have the ability to see all these resources. So JavaScripts, this many JavaScripts, this many CSS files, this many images, this many media come together to build this web page. So that's how it happens. So the, Still it, hung, would, that, would that be fairly standard practice? Like uh, how, how good is our website? Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah, uh, I have some data when I was doing the one. But still, still it, hence a very positive person. <laughs> I it personally looked, think it, you could do with a bit of a spruce yeah. up. Yeah, I will show you. I think it's I know good. a great systems architect could, that can help you. <laughs> so I, can, I will jump back. Board. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. I will jump back to the web slides. Uh, oh, one more thing. Uh, you, if you remember from last week, Elisha mentioned the cookies. Okay. So the cookies can be found in the developer console as well. So I, I'm giving you this information because now one day you can go and play around this website and understand what it really made of. So if you go to applications tab on the same developer tool by, by hitting F12, you will find this section called cookies. So what is a cookie? It's just a key value pair. So the 
cookie has a name and cookie has a value. So browse uh, web pages use these cookies to store your information like encrypted like this or uh, raw information. Anyway, uh, using these cookies, you can do wondrous things like if you logged in, then browser will input a cookie here to know that you are logged in. So it doesn't do this every time, but it just check the cookie. So like uh, Elisha said, the website tracking can, can be done by a third party party cookies. Still, it is a key value pair like this. So pretty much some things that can be done using JavaScript. Okay, I will move to the next slide. Again. This is it. When all enabled, when all the three layers are working together, then we have a pretty good website. Okay, analyzing the web performance, it's an important topic I, uh, because it all comes back to the conversion rate optimization at the end. You want to sell more, you want more profit, that's where it ends. So analyzing the web performance, what is web performance? Really, that is the objective measurement. It's a relative measurement actually, and how it is perceived by the user, his user's experience of load time and runtime. So basically web performance is how long site takes to load and become interactive. Maybe even after it become interactive, the web page may be loading some content, some images, some resources behind the scenes, but it doesn't matter. As long as we can use it, then users will be happy. Why this, this matters? Because it directly affects the, affects the page and the abandonment. See, if a web page is taking too long to load, then the users will be frustrated and then they will go away. It affects the conversion rates. And if you are especially using a mobile, then it affects the bandwidth and even the phone battery lifetime. That is why it is so important to improve your website's performance. And some statistics shows that the websites that load under three seconds is gaining the highest conversion rate. So looks like nobody is going to wait more than three seconds. See if the conversion, the conversion rate is dropping rapidly, drastically, if the page load time increases. So let's say if you have a web page that takes 10 seconds to load, forget about it. So it won't do much good for you. You have to optimize it under this level. And this is becoming very competitive. We need high, high capacity servers and good services like good caching mechanisms. Altogether, we can achieve this, this target. Okay, to measure the website performance, we have some tools. Basically, it starts from the servers. You should have good servers that scale up and high performing calculation rates and better memory. You know, everything uh, comes together to final rendering output. So, but when we measure the web page performance as we see it on the browser, these are pretty good tools, web page test, Google page, in, page speed insights, site feeds, and there are some other paid services as well. These are free. Okay. Guy, now you have an answer for that one, right? <laughs> IT Masters has performed really good. Hey? Ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> Someone just asked a question about um, speed. So that's <laughs> okay. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. Oh, okay. it's, the, Everyone that's will be very happy to hear that. I'll, I'll yeah. be talking about it all day tomorrow. Yeah, the thing is that this is one way of measuring it. There can be some other sites do some different no, calculations. No, once enough, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm moving forward. Now I go here. So what you do is you take a new tab 
web page test you find this one this is the free service it has been there for a long time and let's say service nsw and for the test location you can select anything but it's better if you can select uh, where your customers are so i will prefer this one and use the browser the chrome so you can start the test that means this website will try to load this web page on chrome browser through these servers and will try to analyze the content of it so i'm not going to look for this because it takes some time to do this you can do for your own website i'm explaining it from here so for this website the service nsw website has some good ratings like first but by time is really good that is first by time means how long it took the server to respond with the first bit of data so not everything but the first bit of data and these are some other is the things uh, the resources are compressed while they are transferred that is a good thing because it can save our bandwidth uh, looks like this side does not compress images very well. It uh, could does have saved. Does that mean that some. they're too big, Dilhan? Yeah, it no. can be uh, the same quality images could yes. be reduced much further to achieve little bandwidth. That's the idea. And um, a good a good little platform that's also free is Tiny PNG. That's right. Um, which PNG. we used at Fresh Flowers, didn't we? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. So if you upload an image, this little panda will remind you the yes. version <laughs> of it. <laughs> and uh, so if you upload a PNG or JPG you exported from Photoshop or somewhere, Photoshop still have these capabilities to uh, export web compressed images. But if you upload that image, a raw image for example, this compressed the image into something that is not reduced quality, but still a little, uh, I mean, uh, smaller in the size. So it uh, visually, we can't tell the difference. That's the whole idea. It still keeps its, um, you know, color mm. and size and everything, but yeah. it's just a smaller file and yeah. it takes less time to load. That's right. Yep. So this website has taken 3.7 seconds to load, which is not bad. And the first byte responded from this one. So it is normally said any website should uh, respond under the uh, under 0 0.5 seconds with this first byte. So that's the benchmark, I think. So now we have the benchmark to the page load time, which is three seconds and five seconds in between three and five, I think. So see here, uh, the document has completed loading at 3.7 seconds, but still the fully loaded page has taken five seconds to load. So which means from the back end, they have done something, uh, loaded some resources, but still it has become interactive at 3.7 seconds i will move quickly content breakdown html javascript css images fonts and other things look like this website is uh, making so many requests for javascript this is this could be some point you we can improve the website and half of the website weight i mean the number of bytes has been served through javascript looks like they have heavy JavaScript so they can improve it. So by going through these descriptions, you can find some points where you can start optimizing your web page. That's the whole idea of it. This, this is not a Swiss knife tool that can do everything, but it's a good start point that you can look into the website in a different perspective. Details. And this, this is called the waterfall view. And this from the moment we use the URL, 
this is how the content has been loaded from the server to the browser and with the time they have taken and here we can identify some things that take too long to load or some blocking and restricting scripts so we can improve them okay performance review some details some ideas potential savings this much so th this is kind of a descriptive information about information about some things you can do on your website so pretty much web page test does give you a good idea about your website so another website uh, or, or a tool that can do this is the web uh, web page insights so the chrome has built in this into the developer tool as well developer tool but just i showed you but according to this one it is having a different score because they all do their calculations based on the different hmm. grounds here they say if you eliminate render blocking resources you could have saved this second this much seconds like it's a battle of javascript so you can read it more i'm not going to explain it but using these tools you can start optimizing your web page for better performance okay i'll move forward with one thing okay content delivery network you have heard this definitely uh, and i will explain it quickly so content delivery network is a service that we can purchase from a service provider like cloudflare or amazon's uh, cloudfront what it does is it has a series of servers distributed all around the globe so we use the service just to implement our static resources like css files javascript or images because they don't change they don't change much like a backend business logic does so let's say this user is trying to access your website and it's trying to request an image so the request goes the static resource request goes to the edge server so edge server take a look and it does not have any version of that image so it goes to the original server and it fetches the image and it stores it in here inside cache it's edge server cache so then it is delivered to the user now what happens if the next user trying to access the same image then he goes here and the content is already here so he received the image just out of this server we call it a edge server so it is less time to load for this guy and this one because it's already cached and it's less pressure on the server because it served the image only once and the cdn network has cached it so we recommend for your static resources use cdn it is a very potential uh, saver for your website and it improves the performance drastically so can i just explain the the lows 20 percent off store wide scenario with with that particular example so yes, that so when you've got a whole heap of customers coming at the same time so let's say ten thousand concurrent users all looking for schoolware back to schoolware there's a big sale on there's going to be a lot of calls on the website and a lot of um, page um, requests so what Dilhan just explained is, you know, when you have it in cached on a local server, it actually serves um, an image very easily. Whereas yep. if you don't have that set up, then you'll end up um, coming to a grinding halt um, yes. because the web will get um, over serviced and um, yeah, yeah. It'll not they be are good... optimized. These uh, yeah. CDN services are optimized to handle the high request. They yep. scale automatically the if the number of requests is are uh, is high then they scale automatically to, to serve that but your servers cannot 
That's yeah. why the statics resources better be served through a mm. CDN network. Yep. Great. And Dilhan, would they be on the cloud or, or is that both? Yeah, it, it's a cloud. Yeah, CDN yeah. is basically a cloud. Okay. It seems yeah. like there's massive uh, benefits, like uh, certainly like huge economies of scale. So it sort of seems like the big will continue to get bigger and, and be able to like optimize That's so true. much more. That's true. Like I said, uh, in the previous analysis, most of them were images and JavaScript, right? So if they served through a CDN network, then half of the web page is instantly loaded. So that's the basic idea. Okay, I'm moving forward. Static and dynamic pages tracking. Elisha explained it beautifully, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. So for a dynamically generated web page, uh, I would give a good, better example like Facebook. So Facebook is specially showing content specifically for you. So no one is going, else is going to see what you see because it is dynamically generated for you. But let's say if a static content web page, then everyone is seeing the same content because it's already generated and stored somewhere. So you can, everyone can receive the same copy of the. So that's the basic difference. Is that, this is that was, like the Chelster University homepage? Uh, yeah, basically the homepage is yeah. like static. Yeah. It does not have much uh, dynamic data. Mm. Therefore, it yep. can be uh, cached in somewhere in a CDN maybe fully. Mm -hmm. yep. So it will serve faster. Great. Okay. How these pages can be tracked using cookies, like I mentioned, like Alicia mentioned, tracking pixels. We'll discuss this uh, in detail last time. You know how to check if there are tracking pixels on your web page. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. And then JavaScript based tracking like Google Analytics. So like I mentioned, JavaScript is the brain of the website. And that is uh, in this example, Google Analytics need the uh, user data from your website and who delivers that data to Google Analytics? JavaScript. So what we do is Google Analytics insert some JavaScript onto your web page, approved, uh, the content is approved. So basically the engineers do that, insert the script and the scripts know how to track your data and transfer them into the Google Analytics and it will perform it as a report beautifully understood. That's how it happens. The beacons like ultrasound beacons, they are not much use, but there are many other tracking methods as well. Browser fingerprinting and other methods. Okay, I'm not going to explain this one because we discussed in detail last week. This is a Facebook pixel looks like on the HTML version of the web page, I mean the page source. Most of the tracking pixels can be blocked using a plugin, let's say a browser plugin or an email client plugin. So it does not load these tracking images automatically until you allow it. So if the user, if your user is doing that, then it's hard to track your user through the tracking pixel. Google Analytics is a favorite tool. Millions of people use it every day to track their users' behavior. And it operates on the JavaScript layer of the web page. Okay, I will move to this one. Analyzing the site navigation. Okay, Google Analytics. Uh, if you have already accounts in Google Energy, uh, you have seen these graphs. But let's say you don't have an account. Uh, still, there's a way you can experiment the dashboard by doing a, okay, what is, um, by doing uh, by linking a demo account to your Google account. If you have a Gmail address, then you can sign up for the analytics. And you can use this demo account based on these steps. You can link it to your Google Analytics and you can use it to track. Track what? 
that's the question. <laughs> so Google has a merchandise store. I had it somewhere. They have built a demo store. I'm not sure if it is a demo store is oh actually they are selling these items online. But this analytics data coming uh, from this website. There are so many things, cool stuff. Hopefully so, a couple of you will be interested in using this and having a yeah. bit of a play. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, everyone so, will duck around, so it sure looks like it. Yeah. Mm. So, yes, JavaScript on running on this page, push data to analytics. Therefore, here we are. So I go to my demo account, Google Merchandise Store, Master View. This is the analytics dashboard. And I select last week. And I go to behavior. All pages. And here you see how your web page has been used by the users. So total number of page views, unique page views, average time someone is spending on your page, entrances, bounce rate, exit rate, more information. So if you use some page, if you are interested in this one, you can still check the data. I go to the navigation summary. Here you have, a, I, you can get an idea how your users are hanging around your web page. So let's say this basket HTML. So, so to the basket HTML, users has reached that page from these sources, like from home pages, they have gone to the basket page from the sign in page quick view page and from google search and all those things and they have from there they have moved to the next pages like this and this many entrances this many exits that mean drops of traffic so using this analytics data you can analyze how your audience is going through your website and if you find, if someone, someone is not spending too much time on your web page, you can analyze this data and figure out if there is something you can do to improve that. Another pretty good one would be the user's flow. So this pretty much showing you how the, your users are sourced, that means from where they are coming and how many of them go to the home page, how many of them drops from, drop off from the home page and how many of them are going to the next level of pages and from there, how many drops and like that, like that. So this interaction, or we call it, sometimes we call it a funnel and this shows you how many users finally end up in your page. So you can go through the steps and improve them to finally redirect the customers, focus them into one purpose, like purchasing something from your site. We have many parameters here. From which, which device they are coming from and from which mobile, if, um, even the operating systems, so many information you can grab from this Google uh, Analytics dashboards. Okay, I go back to the slides now. One more thing. Conversion rate optimization. So this is pretty important. 
this is how you uh, how your users end up using your offer so that's the conversion rate what is cro means we have to we are trying our, our all efforts to bump up this number so for this particular example e-commerce conversion rate has been 0 0.16 which is pretty bad right so looks like they have we have much to do to improve this website into a good value like let's then i'm not sure i cannot give you an exact number what is a good conversion rate looks like but it can be two percent three percent one point five percent it's based on your customer base what they are what you are selling and to whom you are selling it so it's not only about the purchases but let's say someone sign up to your web page or someone donates to your web page anyway the end users who end up using the offer you give can be calculated is as a conversion for an example for an e-commerce website we can call it checkout optimization and what can we do it's so hard to guess but one thing to focus on would be a one-step checkout might help or two-step checkout and sometimes users just not like to sign up for the website and make accounts on websites they just like to do the checkout as a guest so if we allow them then your conversion rate would be go high and now there are one click checkouts and some of them have credit card walls so like Braintree, the credit card payment gateway providers have walls that you can save your credit card information like a secure token. So next time you come to the website, if you want to buy something, just one click, you buy it. So you don't have to enter the credit card details. You, have, you don't have to go fetch your wallet to find your credit card in it. So that all those actions can improve the conversion rate. So well-placed elements, buttons can help in bumping up your conversion rate. So it's better if you can study how, what, what is your uh, competitors are doing, how they have placed their elements and how the users are performing on their website and you can get an idea of how to where to improve heat maps Elisha already mentioned that heat map is a um, visual map of the users behaving on your web page like they tend to use their focus on this area compared to this area that's what heat map just show you so whenever your user is behaving or spending much time on your web page that is where you better put your main buttons so for an example if you take your mobile there are some places that you can't access using your thumb or you have the finger you are using to touch it so if you have a place or the button somewhere you can't hardly access then it won't do much good to you so you should move it back to a convenient place so users would allow to press it so something like that so it all depends on your user base that's why i am saying this is not a one day job so conversion rate optimization is not one week job it's not one month job as long as you have your website up and running then still there's time to improve it's still there are things to improve so the you are still on the market with a good conversion rate so check out cro like i mentioned secure socket layer is important because nowadays users pretty much look into it so for an example if you go here this you see this lock sign which is connection is secure it masters your connection is secure so if you see this you get a confident that you can do purchases or anything on this website so for an example i have my website which is a sample 
it is not secure because I'm not using a secure socket lawyer or, or some SSL certificate on my website. So if I place a checkout button here, it would be not that safe to click it. So users look into these days now. Therefore, you better have your sites up and up to date and appealing to them. Going forward, website performance, it all ends up in server performance and every, every fact contribute this one. Using retargeting platforms, Elisha already mentioned that and this fact is more interesting. It looks like abandoned cart automation generate 30% more revenue than regular emails, which is That's amazing. Number. Yeah. And then when it comes, it, I found it somewhere maybe here. Uh, it says that some, if someone purchasing from you, at least they have to see your brand seven times to make up your mind to Correct. purchase it. Yeah. So more and more they see your brand, then it registers in your brain and they try to come back to you. We can do this retargeting using these platforms like Elisha mentioned. Whenever a checkout of any web page is personalized by demographical data, geographical or seasonal, then people tend to purchase more. Let's say Christmas season. So they have this Christmas season now, Christmas promos, banners, then tend, we tend to buy more on this season. Simple page layouts, good search, social media, proof, review, free shipping, free shipping about $100. So these things actually persuade them to do more. So CRO is not about the web page performance, but it is how your users see your website, basically. Landing pages. It is a topic, it's a hot topic these days, I think, in this area. What is a landing page? Is home page a landing page? Mm, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a good one for a poll, right? <laughs> Love it. Or, or, or at least the forum. Yeah. What is a landing page? Check that in the forum, someone. Yeah. Or a so, category page. Yeah. A landing page is a page on a website that directs users to take a specific action. So in that sense, home page would not be a good candidate for a landing page because it has so many things that you can do on that. You can go here and there, you can go to your account page and some banners, but this landing page is basically focus you to a single action. Okay, Facebook ad, landing page, sell page. Okay, I will give you some example. There are two things called top of funnel and bottom of funnel. So normally for an e-commerce website, they say that bottom of funnel is the best to use. So which means you, your users end up here on your web page. At top, you give them your brand awareness, information, why you should use your brand or this specific product. And in the middle section, you tell them what it is look like, testimonials, videos, user comments, anything like that. And you build up their trust. And then at the bottom, you tell them, this is the button, click it and purchase my product. So something like that. So this structure looks like it's generating more revenue and converting more. Okay, together with this land page, there come the terms uh, split testing and A-B testing. Split testing is where you find your best landing page. You have different versions of landing pages, but you don't know which one you should choose as the final, out, final page. So that's why you do the split testing. Both pages should have the same conversion goal. Choose the sample size. You have some statistical calculators online. You can just Google it and enter your current conversion rates and your target. So it will give you a sample size. That means how long you should run this or something like that. Example, so let's say I'm running these two ads on Facebook or somewhere. This particular ad 
redirect user to this web page. And this blue ad redirects to users to this page. Totally different designs. Then I run this ad like 50-50 on a platform and then check, let's say my target is someone to fill up this form and submit this button. Then you can check using Google Analytics how many of them has used this form and this form. If the data is symmetrical, then you will definitely find a good winner if you have a good sample size and a good audience. So if this page wins the race, then actually this should become your landing page. So that's the idea of split, split testing. Dil Dilhan, with the split testing, if you go back there, um, yeah. I, I see that the option B has a phone number attached. Would that be taken into account or, or would that be? Yeah, it's just a design, just right? Yeah, this is just a design. So in one design, I have trialed my hypothesis. Okay, I should enter the phone number. Maybe some people may be interested in by looking at this phone number. Something, a, a hypothesis. Maybe if people will lose this one instead, then we get the idea, okay, the phone number has, does, hasn't made much difference. Yeah, so but, like but, that. But do, do you count the number of people that call given a particular... Uh, it all, yeah, it all depends on how you set up this campaign on your uh, split, uh, let's say Google Analytics or Optimize. So you can uh, yeah. set goals, like if the goal is to click this button, that is your goal. Mm -hmm. So not this one. But if you try to get calls or he, uh, click this one instead, then it's a different goal. So based on one goal, you can determine if the which design has performed that particular goal. So it's best, I, I will show you. Okay, I move forward. A to B testing. Now, let's say from here, you have this number B as your landing page. A, B testing is another type of test that you can do. Take the winner from the slate testing and you define a variation with one element changed. Let's say I choose this one and this green button, you see the green button, right? Yep. Something like that. Yep, okay. yep, yep. So for, uh, I think my hypothesis, I think red buttons would capture more attention. So my variance will have one element change which is the red, blue, green button to red. And you choose the sample size, you find, you run the test, you find the winner and you keep doing this. Hypothesis. So you have this hypothesis, red buttons attract more visitors to click the button, that's my hypothesis. So I create a variation. What, what, what do I do? I make the green button to red in a variation. Then I set goals, like, I, like you asked. So in this one, my goal is to count the people who clicks the button after filling the form. So that's one sort of a test. So if you find, to find the phone number, then it would be a different goal for that specific data. So then you run the test, you examine the data, and you find a winner, and that is implemented to the control. And you keep doing this again and again until you have a, a, a it doesn't end, a, let's say. <laughs> you keep doing this over and over again. Okay, I have few examples here. So version A, version B. See the difference? This has a subheading. Lit, little looks too much complex to me. And here more details. So who would be the winner for this one? Okay, let's go ahead and find out. The here winner is B. Why is that? That's the question. Particularly, we don't know. That's why we should run this test because we don't know how your audience think and we don't know how they react on your web page. That is why we should run the test. Otherwise you, you wouldn't know. Even if you are the best 
guy that who, who can bump up the CRO, but still there might be some missing pieces, like how you audience think does matter. So in here, maybe this has more information or the te text may be more appealing to the user or they have read this one and liked it, but we don't know. The winner is B here. This one, there's a form and we have a trusty privacy mark and this form has nothing. What do you think? Who would be the winner this time? Okay. Show so, me <laughs> Yeah, the thing is that something has happened what? here. <laughs> yeah, that's the reason. So, Unless I don't know the trusty brand. Yeah, yeah. The winner here was B. Or well, like if the you politician the reason, says, trust yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, here, if you heard the reason, you would be amazed. The actual test who run this, you can find more information on those URLs or just by Googling. Actual research has found that whenever people see this certified privacy uh, logo in this particular scenario, they kind of uh, felt like this is some kind of involved with payments. Like whenever we need credit card payments, we push them like Visa, Master, American Express, yep. certified yep. payments, or se secure payment methods like that, right? So once the user has user is trying to fill this form, he got the the subconscious thought that this might be some kind of will end up with a payment. So they were reluctant to fill this one and submit. But here they didn't have such a thought. That's why I did. See, this is pretty weird, right? That's why we don't know this uh, audience. That's why we should do these tests regularly to improve the, uh, maybe it's totally different from what we are assuming. So that's the beauty of this A-B testing and other tests. That's why we should keep monitoring our audiences. There are more tools, Google Analytics, Google Optimize, Optimizely, paid services, Adobe Target, Average, many services. My personal preference would be Optimize, maybe because it's from Google <laughs> and it integrates really well with Google Analytics and it's free. So I will do a little demo and that's pretty much the end of it. Okay, I will go to the demo, something like this. I'm sorry, I'm going to use my personal sample website to do this test. Hope you don't mind. Okay, Google Optimize. <laughs> Google Optimize. So th this is a free service. If you have a Google account like Google Analytics, you can subscribe to this Google Optimize and you have a, Go a, a Chrome plugin that you can install on your web browser to help uh, doing this variance. I'll show you. Okay, so this is my web page. What is my hypothesis here? So I think now uh, these links, I think not many people like to click this. Uh, they don't look at this. That is, so now I'm worried, let's say. So I get a hypothesis. If this headline was red, they may, it may attract more users to click this, right? or they may attract more users to stay on the page. So that's my hypothesis. So based on that, I will set up my original like this. I will remove this first. Targeting and variants. So add a variant, variant one, done. So, my original one, now when I start running the test, half of my audience will see the original version, the black text, and half of my audience will see the red text. That's the idea. So like Elisha mentioned last week, multivariant A-B testing. If you want to do that, then you can add more variants, right? And reduce the weight. 
25% for each variant, let's say, something like that. You can play with around these tools. So I try to edit this and do my change. So I am taken to my dummy website and my optimized tool by is loading, hopefully. Okay, so my hypothesis is I should make this element red. Okay, edit element. Okay. Okay, I will make this. Red. This red or that red. So now I have now I have changed one element. So that is the idea. One element change and we track it. So I save this. Done. Am I taking too much time? It's like, too late for that. Don't you've got a oh, yeah, so you've got a captive audience. <laughs> yeah. The numbers are still, still there. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just no, no, no. It. It's uh, it's it's awesome. <laughs> Thank so you. So now uh, this my fifty percent variant has one change. That's pretty basic much it. And then I have the page targeting and description for it. I can set the description. And my measuring tool is Google Analytics. And here, like, I, I, like you asked, here you can set the objectives. Choose from the list. There are so many things that you can do, like click a button. We can customize this, but I'm not going to any details on it. But let's say some basic things like bounces, page views. You can set a target. So this is this becomes your goal or target pay number of page views or the bounce rate whatever i'm just saying, staying with this one for now and then some other things so i'm ready to go so if i run this from today to let's say somewhere in future Oh, sorry. Where was I? This one. Something like that. Then I can start the test. So that is probably this should do it. So based on their algorithms, optimized algorithm. And based on the JavaScript that's injected onto my web page using web uh, analytics tools and tag managers, the JavaScript will make sure that half of my audience, based on their algorithm, will see the original version of it, and half of the audience will see the red version of it. So at the end of this period, I will end up come up with some statistics, then I can found if this has really helped to make my goal a success. If it is so, then this, this is a good candidate uh, change. So I can change the text to red and I can move to another element and start another A to B test on top of it. That's how you improve using the A to B testing. So that is pretty much it. it finally ends up final about the conversion rate optimizer again. So as long as your website is up and running, then you have so much to improve and your competitors are doing that. They are doing the SEO, they are doing the optimizations. Therefore, you should do it to keep your face, keep you up, up and running and to get, get more sales, more profit. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. If I took more time, then I'm so sorry. And that's much <laughs> it. You're awesome. Thanks so much, Dilhan. I, I hope everyone enjoyed 
the session is very much hands-on. Um, we have we will record it, um, but I'll hand over to Guy. Um, yes. I'm sure there's a few questions. There's only a few, actually. I guess it was it was such a thorough presentation that, that really, you know, it was it was something that made sense. <laughs> yep. um, so I've launched the poll that I promised because, uh, of course, I did. Um, and and <laughs> all right, so let's go for a few questions. There's three that we'll get to, and we yep. won't we won't take any more questions because you know, we've run a little bit long. Melissa asks Dilhan on web page test. After typing a URL, there are several server options to choose for Sydney, Australia. Yeah. How do you choose? So it pretty basically your preference actually, mm, because all these servers are supporting Google web page test, like they are hosting this website to support the community. So therefore you can choose any server. Personally, I choose the bulletproof networks, maybe because I have heard their name and I have worked with them. But uh, you can choose any source because it's same application running on every server. It won't do much different from one server to another. Thank you. Great. Uh, Cameron asks about split testing. Would you, wouldn't you test two variants of an ad directing to the same web page rather than two variants of an ad directing to two different sites? And, and I guess, are, are, there, are there limitations to, to what you can, you can test? Um, no, not really. So basically a landing page, the split testing is to determine what is the best landing page for a particular web page, like your Christmas landing page. So in most of the cases, it would be the same site. But if you do want to test it on different site, it doesn't matter as long as you have this uh, uh, account link to those Web, web, website, analytics account and optimize account. But mostly what we do is in the same web page, website. Thank you, I hope that helps Cameron. Uh, Nick has asked something that I'm not quite sure I understand. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's just because I'm not very technical. So is the change <laughs> simply cached on the Google servers? Sorry? Is, is we were, about five minutes ago, you were talking about, um, Nick, maybe if you want to rephrase the question, that'd be really handy. Uh -huh. Is the change sim simply cached on the Google servers? How does it go with CDN fronted servers? Uh, you mean uh, image? Oh, I'm not sure what. Elisa, Ho what's hopefully Nick's still around. I believe um, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, yep. yeah. So it, it's basically cached on the server, like a resource, like you have a different, uh, version of it cast on the server and it is delivered to the same user because it's the same resource. It's not going to change by user. So let's say image or CSS file. But if a version changed, then uh, let's say if, if something like that, I'll show you. Where was that image? Okay. Let's say if you have something like this version two, 23, this would be one meaning to someone. And if we have updated this element to version number 24, this would, this should be a different result. But uh, once this one is fetched once, then in the CDN, it is, uh, it can be offered to every user that's requesting this URL. But if this is a different one, then it will still go back to the server and face the real version of it. I'm not sure if I answered the question. Oh, I no, I think I that was right. Nick, yep, that's Nick correct. sent in and, and, and yep. clarified that was exactly what he was after. So, so thank okay. you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, I've launched the poll. Oh, sorry, I've shared the poll. Um, last week we asked about how much experience people have uh, and it was heavily skewed to people that don't have much experience. Uh, and again, I asked this week, are you currently in a digital marketing role? Uh, and again, the overwhelming response was no, but I really want to be a digital marketer as I love it. And I'm sure Dilhan, you've helped people. Uh, <laughs> Inspiring, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and plenty of other people have actually said, yes, but we don't optimize like Dilhan describes. And I, I suspect that would be the case for a lot of people. There's a lot of people who are in digital marketing, but there's this so many nice tools thing. out there. Mm -hmm. It's about finding the right one for you. 
It looks yep. like everyone is having a dream of becoming a digital marketer, <laughs> which, is, which is a very good thing because then at the end, the web will be better for everyone, right? And yeah. They work together. Be, yeah. Yep. Hmm. Well, uh, we've run a little bit over time, as you might be aware. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Dilhan. That was incredible. Um, thank you. Clearly, Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Enormous for level of expertise this opportunity. And, and able to Turn it into digestible content. So thank you for that, and thank this you, Alicia, is, for recommending. And this is the first thing, uh, first webinar I'm doing after I came to Australia for an English-speaking country. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I, uh, pardon me for my limited vocabulary, but uh, I really love it. I would like to. We understood yeah, everything you said, and, and, and it shows, yeah. and it well shows done. that love. Um, very exciting. Thank you both. Thank you. Alicia, um, what are we going to talk about next week? Um, it'll be the final, oh. the final okay. content webinar, will it? I'm just in, in awe. <laughs> I've forgotten my place. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, Dilhan, um, what are we talking about next week? <laughs> <laughs> Can you go to the... Yeah. No, yeah, no, let, let, let's yeah. not bother. We've already kept people yeah. for so long. Um, it's, yeah. it's been so wonderful. Thank you, Dilhan. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you, everyone who stuck with us. I hope thank everyone you. who's listening to the recording really enjoyed it. And sorry once again for the, the issues earlier on with the kicking people out of the webinar. Hopefully, hopefully everyone will get something out of this. I suspect they will. I definitely encourage trying the, um, the Google Analytics, um, you know, the store tracking. Um, you can rewind to, well, I say rewind, like it's a tape recording, but you can go to the part in the webinar where Dilhan's explaining that and definitely recommend doing it. Just having a play around. So, but yeah, thanks very much to Dilhan and everyone who stayed, stayed up late. Thank you. Thank you very much.